Thanks so much for coming out on a Sunday morning. Um, it's not just the faithful who get up early on Sunday morning to come out and try to learn something. So this is great, and I appreciate you being here. Um, I uh, have so many things on my mind this morning, and I have this talk I've prepared, which I will give. Um, but I'm so I've been so embroiled with this sort of uh, this Duger family situation, um, and I'm so tempted to just riff on that for an hour, but. <laughs> But I will try not to do that. Um, and the Pew Research uh, Report, I'm actually uh, doing a, um, a fellowship at Claremont Lincoln University in interfaith engagement or interfaith action. And I'm the only atheist in a group of uh, religious folks talking about peacemaking and justice and religion. So uh, that's super interesting. and. I'm always trying to hold down the fort over there for um, skepticism and uh, try to push back against these assumptions that religion is here to stay and nothing's changing. And of course, the Pew report that came out a couple weeks ago certainly helps in doing that. What I want to talk about today um, is just sort of a, I guess in a way, the overview of my story. For those of you that don't know it as well, um, and even for those of you that did read the blog during 2014, there's a lot of things that I didn't share um, about my background. And I think one of the things I'm really eager to share with audiences is that you know, there are different kinds of atheists, primarily uh, based on what they were before they were atheists. So if you've always been an atheist and you grew up in a skeptical, um, scientifically minded household, that, that's a particular kind of atheist. And you, you meet them. And they're, they're quite different than, say, my friend Nate Phelps, who uh, was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church and became an atheist. So two very different type of people and two very different sets of concerns, both of which are really valid concerns, but just different, right? Um, and there are people who have been seriously abused by religion. And there are people who had a pretty decent relationship with religion. Um, so there's lots of reasons why people become atheists and reasons why people lose their faith. And, um, and I think it's important, that backstory is important, uh, lest we think that there's just this kind of one silver bullet that makes people think critically about their religion. So this is my story. And it's sort of, um, it's interesting, I think, for some people because I ran such a gamut, and I want to share that with you this morning. And I want to start by asking you to imagine that we're all, we're all just going to take a tri trip back in time. We're going to get in Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, time capsule and go back before the Copernican Revolution, back when everyone understood and believed that the Earth uh, was the center and that the sun and the other heavenly bodies revolved around the Earth. Um, and you would be just like everyone else in believing that the sun and the moon and the stars were moving in a pattern around the Earth, right? Whether you were an uneducated laborer, a scientist, or a theologian, you would have made the same observation. It was as plain and as obvious as the person standing in front of you. All you have to do is look up in the sky. You can see it happening with your own eyes. The sun is moving across the sky, and then it comes up on the other side the next morning. It's obvious, isn't it, that the sun is revolving around the Earth. And, and you would have also had the Bible on your side. Uh, in the book of Joshua, for example, it says that on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, "Sun." Stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Thank you for laughing. I, I, I wait for every, I've given this talk like three times, and nobody ever laughs at that point. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. So I like, you know, I like to say that the, the writer of Joshua may have been confessing a bit too much with that last little bit, that there's never been a day before or since, since the, with the, the day that the Lord listened to a human being. Um, but these early geocentrists had the Bible on their side, which is, of course, why the religious authorities had so much trouble with Copernicus and Galileo when they said, you know, hold on a minute. I know it seems super obvious, but this is not actually what's happening. 
As a quick aside, I think this is a huge challenge with, with evolution as well. It doesn't seem obvious. It does, it's not intuitive to think that we evolved over billions of years, or millions of years, rather, to the place where we are today. It doesn't, it doesn't seem obvious, especially if you were raised thinking that it was a, a joke. I remember um, you know, watching National Geographic specials with my family, and on the TV would come you know, the narrator, and we'd be looking at this beautiful scenery and amazing stories about animals and you know, nat natural history, and then someone would say, you know, as we know, 500 million years ago or 200 million years ago, and, and we would all just sort of chuckle. Like, it wasn't even really, like, um, a serious consideration. We would just sort of laugh and we're like, well, we know that's not true. Like, you know, the same way you would respond to the opposite, right? The way if someone said, well, God created the earth in six days, and you would kind of go, well, that's ridiculous, you know? Uh, it was the same exact reaction. And it was because it was an assumption. Um, in the 15th century, if someone asked you whether you believed that the earth was at the center of the universe, you would have said, well, yeah, like, why are you asking? Like, this is, seems so obvious. Um, it, nobody would even think to ask the question. Do you understand? Like, nobody would even think to ask the question. It wouldn't even be a question that someone would ask, except for a really extraordinary person like Copernicus who's looking up into the sky, skeptically wondering, is this really how it is, or is there something else going on? Some of the data doesn't match. Let's try to figure this out. It would be like me asking if you believe that the air that we're breathing right now is approximately 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. You, you might say, well, I guess, yeah, I believe that. I mean, actually, I kind of know that because, I mean, I haven't run my own tests, but every scientist in the world believes that, so I don't, it's not really a belief, right? It's, it's knowledge. Um, why are you asking me? And so I begin with this analogy because it really does in, it sort of illustrate the way in which I grew up and many people like me, some of you I'm guessing, grew up in a religious world with the assumption that God exists. Some people arrive at their God beliefs after an adult conversion, though as we saw, not so many anymore. Um, but a lot of us grew up in the church and we just assumed that God exists. I remember, you know, I, I was a Seventh-day Adventist. I, you don't have to raise your hand, but if, if, for those of you that know about Seventh-day Adventists, or maybe you were, um, we, we, our Sabbath, our day of worship was on, is on uh, Saturday, so Sabbath, like, like the Jews. And uh, we had these Sabbath afternoon conversations around the lunch table. We'd often have a guest preacher at our church, and we would talk about science, we'd talk about how we fit the dinosaurs and the fossils into a you know creation narrative. Um, we would talk about evolution. We would talk about um, theology and how we how Jesus could be both a, a man and God at the same time. Uh, all sorts of things. You know why it was really important that women couldn't be ordained as ministers. We talked about that. Uh, we didn't talk about gay people just because it was sort of like the earth revolving around the sun. It was like nobody would even think of that. Like that was not even on the radar. Um, but we never talked about the basic question, sort of the question that's underneath all of those questions, which is, is the Bible reliable? And even before that question, does God exist? And of course, everybody would, in my group would say yes. But then the next question is, well, then how do you, how do you know? And um, I'm sure none of you get into debates on Facebook with Christians. <laughs> Um, but I do all the time. <laughs> and uh, let me explain how that goes. <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, I, I just had this one guy yesterday who just kept quoting Bible verses to me. And offline, he was writing to me too, like on direct message. And I, I said to him, like, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but do you understand how meaningless your Bible quotes are to people on this thread, including me, but others more, more importantly, than, like I still have sort of a theological mind about the Bible, but other people are just like, nope, blah, blah, blah. You know, like when they hear a Bible verse, they're just like, that's not evidence. And it, you know, it's not evidence, it's, it's sort of this circular, I don't have to tell you about this. So we never asked that basic question. We never questioned the existence of God. And when I went to high school, um, I was really growing in my Christian faith. I was living with my grandparents at the time. And uh, they were spiritual giants to me. I had had a rough uh, childhood and ended up living with my grandparents during high school. And they were just deeply spiritual people. Um, I've never met the Dalai Lama, but I, I assume it's sort of like some people report when they meet the Dalai Lama. They're just like a really grounded guy, like really, you know, 
who knows if he is or not, but like, but people have that sense about him or about other people like that. And my grandfather was like that. When he prayed, I just knew that he was communicating with God. Um, and I, so I had this deep spiritual longing to connect with God like my grandfather did. And nevertheless, I did all the sinful things you know, that high school students do. <clears throat> I listened to rock music. I messed around with my girlfriend. Come to think of it, that was pretty much it. I did, never drank or smoked. I, I mean, other drugs were as unthinkable as God not existing. Um, I kept the Sabbath, even when it meant missing football games and dances, every football game and every dance. Um, and when I went away to college, I, I decided I would really give my faith a fresh start. And I threw away all my music, um, all of those bootleg Beatles cassettes that I had recorded off my friend's records. So sad, I know. Like, um, and I broke up with my girlfriend, and I made a clean start. Uh, and I would go, you know, in the mornings, my freshman year in college, I got in with a very fundamentalist group of Adventists. Um, and there was some crazy fundamentalism stuff about the way we like judged other people, but there was also this deeply spiritual part. I would go for a walks in the morning before the sun would come up, and I would talk to God as though he were walking right beside me like a friend taking a walk with me. And it was, it was I, I sort of felt God's presence with me. I, I imagined that God was there with me. And you know, when I would see a deer in the woods, I would think, you know, oh, God bless me with this sort of experience today of, of seeing this um, beautiful nature. Um, I had a hard time figuring out what I wanted to do career-wise, uh, like a lot of young people. I actually started out in math and physics. Can you imagine if I had stayed on that path? Uh, I'd have a very different story. Um, but I hated the lab. I just could not, I didn't have the patience to do experiments that I already knew the results of. I just hated that. And, and everyone was out having a great time, and I was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the chemistry lab, like mixing blue and green. And like, you know, it was just like, oh my goodness, this is mind-numbing. And so I thought, I can't do this. Um, and besides, like, math gets really weird after calculus. Like, it just gets really strange. And I was like, I can't get my head around this. So I went to English. I thought, well, this will be doable. And, um, and I remember, you know, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of Adventist stuff, but um, we have this, you know, I keep saying we. Like, there's just still a part of me that feels, like, somewhat connected to that history. But the Adventists have this prophet named Ellen White. You may have heard of her. And she wrote a lot of books, and in many of them, she talked about the dangers of reading fiction. And yet, I was an English major in, in college, at an Adventist college. And um, my great books class, my freshman year, um, or maybe it was my sophomore year, uh, one of the first books on the list was Voltaire, Can Voltaire's book, Candide. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because Ellen White names Voltaire by name and says, this is an example of an infidel author that you should not read. This will corrupt your mind, and you'll lose your faith. And so I went to my teacher, and I said, I can't read this. You, I mean, she's a Seventh-day Adventist. The school's Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought, I, I don't, you know, and she labored with me. She gave me an independent study in which she tried to disabuse me of some of my fundamentalist notions, at the conclusion of which I wrote a 20-page paper defending my original position. Um, and then transferred to an even more fundamentalist college in the hills outside, in the mountains outside of Sacramento, a beautiful place uh, called Weimar, sort of halfway to Reno, Nevada. And graduated with a degree in pastoral ministry and started at the age of 22 as a pastor in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And it was there that I began to loosen my grip on my fundamentalism because I met people, real people with real problems with real life experiences, children, grandchildren, you know, stuff that we all have in our lives. And, and people don't fit nicely and tidily into ideological positions. Just to take it out of the realm of religion for a minute, you know, if you studied economics in, in university and then you go out into the real world, you realize, you know, the theories are good, but the reality is a little different than the theory and things are, you know, it's not quite as tidy and neat as the theory suggests. This is true for psychology, it's true for medicine, it's true for everything. You have these great theories and then you have the actual experiences that are challenging those theories at all times and causing us to adjust and make improvements. And so I started into that process. I met Christian people that loved God and were Seventh-day Adventist believers and came to church every week who, for example, smoked. 
which is against the rules for Seventh-day Adventists. You're not allowed to smoke. It's like being Mormon or, or some other, like even drinking caffeine. I can remember my youth leader when I was a student was, was disciplined from the church because he drank a Coke, you know, because you're not supposed to have caffeine. Um, so I met this guy. He was a member of my church, probably 55, 60 years old. And every Wednesday, he would get his riding lawnmower take it on a trailer in his truck over to the church and spend about three hours mowing the gigantic lawn at our church. And he refused payment and he refused, you know, accolades. He wouldn't let us acknowledge him in church and thank him publicly. He said, I I just do it because I want to. I do it for the Lord, you know. I don't do it for people. And I was like, wow, that's impressive, you know. He's just giving of his time. And then he came to me one day and said he had to drop his membership from the church. And he, I, couldn't believe it. And he said, well, he's smoking. And the last pastor said that he had to drop his membership because he was smoking until he quit. And I remember thinking to myself, that's crazy. Like, wouldn't you want a group of supportive people around you if you were trying to kick a bad habit? Like, I mean, that's the, probably the people you need around you are the people that believe in you. So I said, no, don't do that. That's ridiculous. And at that moment, I realized, like, I'm breaking some rule of my church, you know, by letting him stay or whatever. But I, it didn't really bother me that much. You know, it's sort of like, it's a slippery slope, you know? They, you start with letting people smoke, and the next thing you know, you don't believe in God anymore. <laughs> so I started this process, this slow process of liberalizing my beliefs. Um, fast forward, so not to take up the entire day, um, I eventually went to seminary a few years later. Uh, it was not a liberal seminary by any stretch. Again, a Seventh-day Adventist seminary in Michigan. And I was basically, seminary is not designed in the Adventist church to teach you to be a thinker or a theologian. It's more designed to teach you to be uh, like a vocational school, you know, how to be a good Adventist pastor. Nevertheless, I took some history classes. They couldn't, you know, avoid teaching us all of that stuff. And it was a a 20th century theology class. And of course, as you probably know, theology went through a huge upheaval in the 20th century as the church tried to adapt to modernity. And one of the heroes of 20th century theology is a guy named Rudolf Bultmann whose project was to demythologize the Bible. That is to take uh, the Bible and say, well, you know, we know the miracles didn't really happen. You know, Jesus didn't really walk on water because have you ever seen anybody walk on water? So probably Jesus didn't walk on water. Um, and, and he took all of that and, and began to demythologize the Bible and teach that the Bible is a helpful myth, not uh, a, a word of God, you know, or, or a a mandated instruction from the Lord that we all have to believe is literally true. And of course, I was taught that in seminary so as not to believe in that, but to be aware of it as a danger. So um, so I, I started thinking about that, you know, and it, it kind of got under my skin a little bit. And I also took another class that was about miracles and how miracles actually happen if we just believe in them. And it wasn't quite that simplistic, but almost. And uh, but I felt myself siding with Boltman in that debate. You know, I, I felt myself going, this makes sense to me, that the Bible emerged as a story of what people thought was true the be- to the best of their understanding and probably with a little wishful thinking. And, and that's why we have it today. It's like any other you know, ancient mythology that's trying to grapple with the real world but in poetic terms. Um, So I I felt myself slipping to the wrong side, and I knew it was the wrong side, but I also knew that I was a pastor and I was a member of this church. So I I left seminary after I graduated and went back to Pennsylvania, where I had a different church this time, and it was um, the fall of 2000. And a year later, uh, as we all remember, some airplanes were flown into buildings by religious fanatics and killed a lot of people in New York and Washington and in Pennsylvania. And I was sort of right in the middle of you know, Pennsylvania, New York, and Washington, and, and it was a huge, I know it was huge out here too probably, but back east it was like, unlike anything any of us have ever experienced before that are like my age and younger for sure, um, probably not since the bombing of Pearl Harbor was there anything quite this dramatic, and it was like waking up from a dream for me, um, and I realized, that my, my theology took a radical shift to the political, and I realized how complicit American Christianity was with the, um, uh, the American imperial project, you know, the, and the way that the church had been totally subsumed under American nationalism and consumerism and all the rest. 
one of the evidences of this for me was that immediately all around town, anyone with a movable lettering sign on their business, whether it was a church or a bar or a hardware store, the, the letters, the, the sign was immediately changed. And I, can you guess what the sign was changed to? God bless America. Bumper stickers, you know, man, the bumper sticker industry just boomed during that time. If there is such a thing, you know, all these bumper stickers about God bless America, these colors don't run, um, and so forth. And it struck me in that moment that this expression, God bless America, was so paternalistic and so narrow-minded. It was basically just saying God's on our side, completely like the Islamic fundamentalists would say God was on their side, right? It's really no different. Like the theology that says these infidels need to die, let's fly planes into buildings, is not very different than the theology that says let's go to war, God is on our side too. Now, whether or not there needed to be a war and all of that's a whole nother conversation, but just I'm just saying the theological underpinnings of that discourse is that God takes sides in geopolitical debates and and violence, and it was it seemed so offensive to me, as essentially a pacifist, you know, coming from a, the radical Reformation and a kind of like Mennonites, and that was my background as an Adventist. I didn't believe in war in the first place, so bringing God into war for me was like blasphemy. Like I couldn't I couldn't believe it. Around that same time, I had another experience with movable lettering signs. Um, I tell, you know, I used to tell pastors just get rid of that movable lettering sign. It's very dangerous, you know, it's, you, somebody's liable to put some really stupid shit on that sign, um, and you'll wish that you hadn't done that. Um, so I was driving at the church, right across the street from my church was an Orthodox Presbyterian church, and it always had some dumb slogan on the sign, but for some reason, this one really caught my attention. It was, it was a hot summer Philadelphia day, muggy as... Oh, it was just like so awful, one of those horrible days, and I was enjoying a moment of air conditioning in my car, and I drive by this church, and the sign says, you think it's hot out here, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's clever. Yeah, that's a good one. And the next thought that I had was, I wonder if they really think that someone that's going to drive by, read that sign, and think, let's go there next Sunday. <laughs> right? Is that their, is that, I mean... Or did anybody think at all when they put that, you know, it made them chuckle, so they put it on the sign, you know, for everyone else to enjoy. You know, and I thought, no, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to choose to go to that church because of that sign, which is probably a good, good thing, but the unintended consequence. And, and in that moment, right after that thought, I had this other unbidden thought. And I, I tell Christians now, just be aware of your unbidden thoughts, these questions that pop into your mind momentarily, and then you put it away. Like, why did you put it away, and what was that thought about? So for me, this thought came into my head, and I, I said to myself, I would not easily become a Christian if I wasn't one already. I was like, whoa, that's radical. Like, I mean, what am I doing? Is there a way, why would I want to convince other people to become something that I'm, like, dubious about myself? But I had a job to do, and, you know, kids at home that needed to be picked up from here and taken there, and sermon to write, and a church administrator to make sure was doing the right thing. And so I was like, eh, you know, I just, it's one of those thoughts that goes in and out, right? It was 10 more years before I would understand and really give time to that thought. So I moved to Hollywood in 2005. So almost my 10-year um, LA-versary. And uh, I moved to Hollywood, which I soon discovered is the center of the world for homemade religions. Uh, <laughs> We, and, and what's great about L.A. is that you can mix them in any way you like, too. It's like, it's like um, you know, like fusion, you know, like, um, or, or like a mashup. Like, you just, you know, mix these things in really creative ways. It's probably a sociolog so sociologist, like, Petri dish. Like, it would be great, you know, if you were a sociologist to just, like, poke around Los Angeles. You could find out all kinds of crazy things. I mean, Pen the Pentecostal movement, the, you know, Azusa Street Revival started here in the 19-teens or 19-aughts. And uh, we have Scientology here. We have, you know, probably the center of Kabbalah is, is here, probably outside of uh, Israel, and all these yoga studios, which are fantastic, probably, and, but also people kind of have different takes on that. And 
African-American megachurches, and of course the cult of wealth and fame just adds a whole layer of weird to all of that. And, and everyone around here is spiritual but not religious. <laughs> and I was never raised with that. Like I thought, like if anything, it was when that craze of spiritual not religious, you know, Time Magazine and Newsweek all had big cover stories about that. I thought, you know, I feel like I'm religious but not spiritual. <laughs> I wonder if there's anybody like me, you know, like, like, like Jews are religious but not spiritual, you know, right? Like, I, I don't know how many of you are, are come from a Jewish background, but I loved m my Jewish friends because I thought, these people I can relate to. Like, there's no bullshit, you know, but it's just like, this is our tradition, this is our ritual, this is our family, this is our culture, and we celebrate that, and you know, and then we go to work and we do what we do, you know? It's not like, you know, we don't expect God to come down and zap things or change things. And so I started feeling more religious but not spiritual in a community of people that's largely spiritual but not religious. And uh, I've always struggled to know what this word spiritual really means for people. And again, it is a fascinating sociological uh, discovery or, or process of f trying to figure out what that means. Uh, all along this journey, I'm becoming more progressive in my theology. I'm more committed to orthopraxy, less committed to orthodoxy, um, which again, I, I, I think I learned largely from my Jewish friends. Um, I was more at odds with my denomination as time went by regarding their stand on LGBT people, evolution, and their persistent doubling down on their special uniqueness, you know, that Adventists are the special unique ones that are somehow more important and have a more vital role to play in the world than any other Christians or any other group of people. And it finally came to a head in March of 2013. I was, I was used to being called into my boss's office on a regular basis to account for my various misbehaviors, maybe a blog I had written about immigration reform, or perhaps a petition I'd helped to launch to stop the Adventist Church's endorsement of Prop 8, or our observance of the liturgical calendar in a decidedly non-liturgical church. And by March of 2013, I had really, at that point, worn out my welcome. And I had also come to the, energy, uh, the end of my energy to struggle against this type of stuff. Because in a way, I was being dishonest, first with myself and then with other people. Because I kept trying to move the target so that I would still be Adventist. And I would say, like, no, I'm really Adventist because this is what Adventist means. And you guys are the, the, the weird ones, right? And then I had these, you know, former Adventists say to me, Ryan, there's like 10 of you. And the rest of them are like that. Like, you're the anomaly, not them. You know, try as you might, the normal middle-of-the-road Adventist is a fundamentalist. You know, you're not going to change a 12 million-person global church, like one pastor in Hollywood. But I kept thinking that I could, could do that. And by March of 2013, I had really been worn out. Like, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't care enough about it to, to try to change it. Like, there's some things that are worth changing, like you know, like ending this persistent racism that we experience in our country. That's worth struggling for. Even if you die losing, that's worth struggling for. A little Christian sect, you know, like, it was, like, why save it? Like, I don't understand. I, I just lost my passion to save that. And I felt more at home with my other religious colleagues than my own Seventh-day Adventist pastors. And I came to a day that I've called since then Truth Day, Actually, I told my boss it's truth day. I said, you know, ask me anything. I'll tell you what I think about these things. And I knew that that would be the end. Um, eventually, at the end of that conversation, uh, I was fired um, or forced to resign and started a, a nine-month period of really feeling quite uh, confused about what to do with my life at that point. I had only been trained to be a pastor, which didn't mean I didn't have any skills. But on a resume, it certainly looks like you have no skills. Like, you know, you have, like, all your job history for 20 years is, like, pastor of this church, pastor of that church, pastor of that church. And, you know, an employer is like, right, so you don't know anything <laughs> is what you're trying to say. Like, so, great, great, great. No, I ran, like, multiple nonprofits, had a staff, raised budgets, you know, like, I did all that stuff. But nobody thinks of that when they see, like, pastor on your resume, even if you detail it out. I tried to find a church to go to, and that didn't go so well. I found out that when I wasn't in charge of the church to make it the way I wanted it to be, it wasn't nearly as much fun 
or as fulfilling or inspiring to me. They were worried about all the things that I didn't really care about. And so very soon, I just found a secular church at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, beautiful views along the Pacific Coast. And I would take time each Saturday. I found out that on Saturdays at LACMA, the food trucks line up along Wilshire Boulevard. I don't know if you know that, but that's pretty awesome. So you could go and like feast in the museum and then come outside and feast on all that stuff. It's a great, great morning. Um, except for the parking, but anyway, it's, a, it's more or less a good morning. Like you can like lose your mind with the parking and then refi- you know, find your mind again in the museum. My marriage also ended during this period of time, this nine months between losing my job and the end of, the 20, of 2013. And it really felt like my life was falling into pieces, like all the, the classic supports. I, I call it in my, on my blog, I wrote a post a year, you know, year and a half ago called Life is Like a Game of Jenga. You know? And it really had felt like losing my job was that final piece that got pulled out and the whole thing just came collapsing down. And I knew, even though I didn't know how it would go, that I was rebuilding everything in my life from my intellectual frameworks on up. Um, And at the end of that year, I had really come to a crossroads. I obviously didn't see any future for myself in religion, but it was all I'd ever known. I had thought of applying to law school, but my undergraduate degree was at such a fundamentalist college that it wasn't accredited and come to find out no law school will accept an unaccredited bachelor's degree. Good to know. Um, and, uh, you know, so I thought, well, what am I going to do with my life? I go back to, so that's my answer is always to go back to school, which I was trying to resist. Um, but I also felt like my life was taking a really positive turn as well. Like things that I had not paid attention to were finally on my radar. Um, and during that, those final months or weeks of 2013, I, a, a metaphor came to mind. And this metaphor was actually given to me by my former boss in one of our last conversations before he fired me. And he said to me, as we were struggling about what to do, like he wanted me to quit and I wanted to make him fire me. And neither, it was like this standoff. He's like, don't you want to quit? Don't you want to like do something different? And I'm like, no, not really. I kind of like my church. Uh, because my church was awesome. Um, they were like 100% behind me, all the things we were doing together, they were supportive of. He's like, don't you, know, don't you want to quit? You're like, maybe you want to start your own church outside the denomination. And I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> but you don't believe in all these things. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Like, but it's not okay with us. And I'm like, well, then you should fire me. Like, you know? And he didn't want to fire me because he knew that it would cause shockwaves around the denomination. I mean, I wasn't, you know famous, famous, but in Adventism, like people knew who I was and I had been writing for years about what we were doing. So I finally came down to it and right before he fired me, he said, Ryan, don't you think you've outgrown the Seventh-day Adventist church? And I I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he would say something like that. Of course, that had definitely dawned on me, um, but I didn't think he would use that kind of an expression, you know, because what does that mean? Does that mean that the Adventist church or any church is something one outgrows? And what about him at the age of 72? I mean, had he stopped growing in order to stay in the church? Like, so many questions were swirling through my mind as I thought how to answer his question. And I said, you know, I I think so. Yeah, I'm a little sad about that, but I think that's probably true. I'm just not sure, like, are you okay with that? I mean, as the president of the church in the LA County region, are you comfortable with the idea that people outgrow your church? What does that say, that the church is for infants, for children, and then they grow up and leave? Like, if I were you, that would keep me up at night. Like, that's really a problem, don't you think? And, well, you know, it's not what he meant. And and then then a few minutes later, he said, you're like a bird that's outgrown the cage. (laughs) And I was like... Wow, if ever anybody whacked me upside the head with a two-by-four to, like, get the message through, I was like, here's the guy who's the president of the church in the region telling me the church is a cage and that I'm a bird that's trapped. And I thought, yes, this is exactly the truth. Finally, we agree on something, you know? And I thought, that's it, that's it. And at that point, I thought, I need to do what birds that get out of cages do. I need to fly And I did, I thought, that's it, I'm out of here. And for nine months, I tried to figure out where I was flying. Um, And and then at the end of that year, I had really come to the end of my searching and I thought, you know, the one door in the house that I haven't opened to see what's back there is this door that says, there isn't really a God after all. 
right? Like, and I felt like for years, my colleagues, my closest colleagues, the most progressive pastors among us had been dancing around this question too. I had written talks about really why prayer isn't answered, um, about how the absence of God, the sense of God's absence is really the sign of God's presence. Um, <laughs> what, you haven't heard that before? <laughs> No, there's, there's a, like a serious theology about the absence of God. Bonhoeffer wrote about that in prison right before the Nazis killed him. I personally think if he had survived that, that Bonhoeffer would have found his way to being secular. One of the last things he wrote before the Nazis assassinated him uh, was that he felt far more comfortable among his secular and unbelieving friends, and not for the purpose of evangelizing them, he emphasized, but because it just felt more like home to him. And the sense of God's absence was overwhelming to him, um, and he just could not accept the complicity of the church with what was happening in Germany. And if you ever want to read something fascinating, um, it's a little tedious, but read Letters and Papers from Prison by, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and you'll get a sense of a man who's going through, obviously, one of the worst times in his life. He, he didn't survive it, and, and really begins to question everything about what he believes um, and what the purpose of it all is. And I was also at that place. I really wanted God to exist. In a way, the year without God was my effort to find God if God was there to be found. But it was also my, my sort of my manifesto to say, if there's not a God, I want to know. And I want to live my life with integrity and honesty and in a way that's not going to kill me before I'm you know, 90 or something like that. Like, I, I felt like I was getting sick. I was, you know, the cognitive dissonance was really taking a toll on my health and the dissonance with my denomination. And so I put up a blog post on Huffington Post, as you now know, called A Year Without God, A Former Pastor's Journey into Atheism. And I talked about how I was going to try on atheism for a year. And in my defense, I put try on in quotes, people. I knew that it was, you know, dubious claim. And, uh, but I didn't know how, you know, questionable that would be for a lot of people. And, and I said, I'm going to live this next year as though there's no God and see what it looks like, see what, what, what life is like. And uh, the next day, Hemant Mehta wrote a blog post. As I've come to find out, everything in the atheist community begins with a blog post from Hemant Mehta. <laughs> and Hemant said, you're doing it wrong. That was his, he's like, to the, to the former pastor who's trying on atheism, comma, you're doing it wrong. And I thought, well, that's just great. Like, for years, people have been telling me at Christianity that I've been doing it wrong, and now, now the atheists are telling me I'm doing it wrong. I just can't, can't catch a freaking break here. Like, I, you know. So because I had positioned Year Without God to be a learning experience, I reposted Hemant's blog on my post, and then I, on my blog, I put a link, and I said, am I doing it wrong? Like, somebody teach me then, you know, because I knew nothing about atheists or the atheist community or the arguments or all of the debates that had happened. I had read... Dawkins book, God Delusion. I had read Hitchens book, uh, God is Not Great. And I had read Letter to a Christian Nation by Sam Harris, but that was it. And, and I found myself agreeing with almost everything they said, even though I thought that they sort of fell far short of analyzing the whole of you know, the Christian experience in America. They were looking at probably two thirds of it, the fundamentalist and evangelical part of which I had an equal disgust uh, for that as they did. So I felt like, yeah, like I, I you know, that God is not great, you know, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I couldn't go as far as to say religion poisons everything. In fact, I still don't think religion poisons everything, but uh, that was my limited experience with atheism. And so, so Hemick helped clarify, and then podcasters called, and then CNN called twice, and Washington Post, BBC, NPR, uh, morning news thing in Australia, and uh, I just couldn't believe what was happening. I had no idea. Like, I did not Google atheist before I put up that first blog post. Like, I did not check to see, like, where is there an atheist meetup in Hollywood? <laughs> like, I just, I, I, I had no concept. I drove right by this building, like, probably every day for eight years. I had no idea what CFI was. I had no idea that Atheist United was here. I, in fact, in that first blog post, I said, if there are atheist gatherings, I'd like to visit some, you know? <laughs> you know? And, you know, there's probably like, I don't know, 25,000 podcasts, it seems to me, out there. You know, I'm trying to keep, keep track of it all. 
Um, so these early interviews helped me to understand what I was getting into, helped me clarify my misunderstandings about um, religion and atheism, what it meant to not believe. Um, and so I just, my goal was to back up a step, that original assumption that I talked about in the very beginning of just assuming that God was there. My goal was to say, what if I didn't do that? What if I just could go back in my mind and take away that assumption? Because basically what, what I find that Christians are, when Christians are debating atheists, they're starting with an assumption that God exists, and atheists are starting with an assumption that God doesn't exist. And they're arguing with each other based on different assumptions. And so you know, I said, well, the only way for me to really get through this is to say, let's just assume for the moment that God doesn't exist. Does the world make sense? Am I going to commit suicide next week because I'm so depressed and discouraged because God doesn't exist? Is it all dismal and, and you know, disastrous? And, uh, you know, is it all nihilism? And I found that it wasn't, that I had a, almost a renewed sense of appreciation for people, for the moment that I live in right now. I felt much more attuned to the present, um, to the people in my life, to the relationships that mattered to me. It was much easier for me to discard relationships that didn't matter to me, that I was maintaining for what purpose, I don't know. Uh, when people rejected me because of my experiment, so to say, I, I was like, okay, like, that's okay. Like, I'm on a quest to figure some stuff out for myself, and if y'all don't want to come along for the ride, that's totally fine. And I didn't mean it with, like, a sour grapes kind of, I mean, I just literally meant, like, this is for me. You don't have to come along. We don't have to be friends anymore, if that's what it means. I was desperate to know the answer to some of these nagging questions that I had been putting on the top shelf of my mind for upwards of 15 years. It was a painful experience in many ways. It felt like the death of a loved one to recognize that God didn't exist. The thing, you know, everybody, like I said in the beginning, there are different kinds of atheists. Um, another way that there are different kinds of atheists is that different sets of arguments make the most sense to different people. So for some people, the scientific angle is the way that they really feel like that's why they're an atheist. For me, it's the history. Uh, for me, it's the history of how humans have uh, manufactured gods over uh, our entire existence over our entire evolution and how we've created those gods for very evolutionary reasons and how they served uh, purposes that they no longer serve today. And that all makes a lot of sense to me. And I feel now almost no compunction to believe in God. I don't feel like, gosh, I've lost something really important. I feel like I've discarded something that I don't need anymore. Like a sweater that I love. Like I have this sweater. I just gave it to my daughter because she likes to wear things with holes in them. Um, <laughs> But I have this really wonderful wool sweater. I've worn it for years, and moths finally ate holes in it last year. And I, I wore it a couple times with holes in it because I like it so much. And then the blue shirt is like showing through the black sweater, and I'm like, that looks tacky. You know? And it took me a while to admit that the sweater was, it was over. Right? I needed to get rid of this sweater. You know? I, I just took me a while. And I think religion was like that for me, too. I, I knew the game was over, but I kept playing the game for longer than I ought to because I was finding ways to make it serve my ends, uh, to make the world a better place, to mobilize people to doing good in the world. And, uh, and so I finally came to the end of the year, and I said, I don't, I don't know that there's not a God. I don't really know any atheists who know that there isn't a God or who would claim to know for sure. I don't feel the need to know for sure. Um, so I just feel comfortable not believing in God because I don't see the evidence for it. I don't see the difference that it makes. You know, if, you know I find these Christians that want to debate about theology and, and God, and God is like this first cause and all that stuff. And then I, you know, at the end of all of that, I'm like, so what? Like, let's say for the moment that God is the first cause. Let's say for the moment there's a God that's beyond finding out that is the first cause of everything. Great. Now what? You're going to go to church and worship that? You're going to pray to it? You're going to, like, burn offerings to it? Like, what? No. Like, so for all practical purposes, that God doesn't exist, right? Like, so I see no, I, I'm, I'm just always baffled how people can make these really abstract arguments for God and then go to church on Sunday morning and sing songs. Because I just don't see the connection between the two things. So now I'm rambling, and I'll stop there because I know you have questions, and I'd really like to get to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. So what are you doing now to make a living? I work at, well, that's, look, that's a great example of a good question, right? Quick. Uh, I work at PATH, uh, which is um, 
we have 22 locations from San Diego to San Jose, but the main one is here in Silver Lake. It stands for People Assisting the Homeless. And I work in the development department, and I do uh, community engagement for them. So that means I interact with community groups, uh, government stakeholders, um, our contracts in local communities with street outreach. So we do a lot of um, street outreach where teams of people go out two by two and talk to homeless people on the street and engage with them and invite them to accept services and um, find their way back home. And so, yeah, that's what I do. It's, it's pretty great. And in fact, uh, I wanted to mention that last Sunday at this time, I was speaking at the Mount Hollywood Congregational Church, which is one block this way. Um, and they are the only church that's ever invited me to speak since I did Year Without God. And they're about 20 people, really great people, most of them post-theist, um, and had absolutely no problem. I had this little, I checked, I'm not making this up, she's 90 years old, because I asked, uh, her pastor, and she came up to me about this big, and she said, I really appreciated your talk, but I think you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So then another guy came up to me and said, I see that you're speaking at Atheist United next weekend. What if the two of us teamed up and did a project for the homeless or something together and worked together on a service project, a church and Atheist United? So I said, well, I'm going to be there next week. I'll, I'll ask them if that would be something they'd like to do. Personally, I think it would be awesome because it would, number one, break down some stereotypes that folks have about both atheists and Christians. And, uh, and it would be good for the community. I'm not sure exactly what it would be. We could work out the details. But I wanted to throw that out there for the leadership and, uh, and for some of you to think about. So, It's a bit sensitive, but um, you don't have to answer. How is your family handling your transition. I know you mentioned the divorce and it's probably painful, so you don't have to. Yeah, no, I mean a lot of people ask and you know, it's it's one of those things where some people are probably more dispositionally private than other people. I'm I'm not <laughs> I've obviously not got a problem with publicly exposing everything in my life. Um, people were like, "Why did you write a blog about losing your faith?" and I'm like, "It just never occurred to me not to, I guess." I mean, I've been blogging all of my life about everything I, you know, at the church and everything, so um, so the, you know, the main thing people ask is whether the divorce was a result of what I did with my losing of my faith. And that, that's not the case. Um, you know, if any of you have been married or are married, you know that it's, you know, a challenge at times to be married. Um, and we had our challenges. And the Jenga analogy, you know, is, I think, the thing I would come back to, that when losing my faith, losing my job was actually maybe the, the Jenga, the final Jenga piece. And then my marriage and my, my faith and my place in the community, all of that was connected, right, in that tower. And um, I knew I would have been fired from my church if I had left my wife and we got separated um, because that's not allowed. And so in, in some ways, we were staying together to protect everything in our life, our kids and our job and our everything. And when one piece left, you know, fell out, then it was easier for all the other pieces to fall down. Um, it's, been, it's been challenging. Um, you know, my kids are 11 and 14, so they're at an interesting age, to say the least, uh, in many regards. But with regard to religion, I don't think they're really that interested in religion. I mean, I think they're one of these, you know, the, the generations that you saw up here on the screen, like they're the next one, which is not even on the chart yet, which is like, what's religion? Like, you know, kind of like, <laughs> Or, or my daughter said to me over, over dinner one day, we were talking about this, and she's like, Dad, I just, I just feel like I believe in God. And I'm like, that's okay. That's fine. You have a lot of time. Just keep your mind open. Ask good questions. When you go to college, just study everything. Pay close attention. Ask every question that pops into your mind. Don't let anybody tell you that any questions are off limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like tracking with that and like, yeah, I love science and I love history. And, and why do people make up all these religions anyway, she said. <laughs> like five minutes after she had just said she believed in God. And I'm like, you know, it's a great question. And I'm trying to figure that out too. And it's a lifetime of studying like why cultures felt a need to explain unknown things by creating stories about what they didn't understand. And uh, so I have no concerns about whether they'll be rational adults. Um, but it is, it is hard. For example, they're not with me right now because my ex-wife doesn't want them coming to any of my talks, 
or whether I'm speaking or not, like she doesn't want them exposed to this. So I've tried to say like, it's not like, you know, joining a criminal gang or something like that. It's like, you know, although some people think that about atheists, so. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so I guess you kind of, this is just, all I have is a, like a nitpick of your presentation and I guess you kind of answered it in your, in your, in that last comment you made, but is it, would it be considered counterproductive to refer to things like 9-11 as religious extremism, especially since religious, religious people don't view all religions the same? Yeah, I mean, this is a, of course, this is a huge uh, debate. Um, so, uh, um, I, th I think on the one hand, it's, it's good to take people at their word. So if they say that they're motivated by their religion, they probably are to some degree. I don't think all Muslims, obviously, would identify with that religious motivation. They would say, no, their religion, same, same. Let, let's take it out of Islam, because that's so explosive and, and controversial. Let's say um, uh, Christianity, which is closer to all of us, certainly closer to me. Um, you know, would this quiverful movement and Bill Gothard and the, sort of the roots of the Duggar family, like, do I identify with that? No way. Was I ever a Christian like that? Actually, I went to some Bill Gothard seminars at, you know, with my family, and Bill Gothard was a common source of conversation in our family. But I was never like the Duger family. I never had that kind of religious, cultic, almost, upbringing. Um, is it Christian? Yeah, I think there's, it, you can't separate the Duger family from Christianity, I don't think. I'm not saying it represents Christianity, but I don't think you can separate it neatly out and say, oh, it has nothing to do with Christianity. So I think that people who are doing really horrible things in the name of religion, um, it's not representative of their religion probably, but it's definitely um, a possible reading of that religion. There are many possible readings of all religions. Violent extremism is one possible reading because we keep seeing it and it keeps happening um, in our midst. So I, I think it's what's safest and best for us in terms of peacemaking and the moving forward in the future in a practical sense is that we analyze the layers of meaning that are present in any ideology. And in the ideology of, of, of Islamic extremism, there is a layer of colonialism, you know, Western colonialism in the Middle East, definitely. There's a layer, layer, layer upon layer of, of issues. And one of those layers is, I think, religion. If, even if it's only authorization, even if they only say, and on top of it, the Quran says it's okay for us to do this. So I th it's a component. I think it's a component. Um, but it's definitely um, an extreme part, I think. I want to come back to the fundamentalist question, if I may. Sure. I lived with uh, Wahhabi extremists in Saudi Arabia for 14 months. Wow. And my current girlfriend, and, and these are ones who believe that the Crusades never ended and that they are still being constantly attacked by Christianity and the only way to remedy that is to wipe out all non-Muslims. My current girlfriend is a liberal Muslim from Singapore. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about these two groups on either side of the scale, the spectrum, the extremism, is that they're both badly in denial of each other. The Wahhabists deny that the liberals are Muslims and the Muslims, the, the liberal Muslims deny that the Wahhabists are following the true path of the Prophet Muhammad. Now we all want to side with the liberals because they're the peaceful ones and so we tend to side with them by saying, yeah, that's right, those extremists are it not. It serves our purpose. Exactly, well, that's my question. Do you think it does? Politically, I think it serves a purpose. I mean, this is why you see people like Barack Obama say that it's not Islam, that it's something else. Because politically, um, he can't afford to uh, kick that hornet's nest, right? Like if the President of the United States goes on record saying we're at war with Islam, I mean, who knows? what happens after that. I mean, so I think that's dangerous and risky, and I understand the political calculus 
around that. I mean, for example, you know, Barack Obama said that he didn't think, he thought marriage should be between a man and a woman up until fairly recently, and then he said we changed his mind. I don't, I don't think for a minute he changed his mind. I just think it became politically uh, convenient for him to side with, with um, uh, marriage equality. Um, and I, I'm not even sure that's a bad thing. I mean, he's the president of the United States. There's a lot on his mind. I, I don't know what the right thing is for him to do because I'm not the president of the United States, and I don't know. But I do, I do think that it, for us, who are not the president of the United States, it's important to get down to, to the pieces. You know? And I think what I see when I watch Sam Harris debate Reza Aslan on Twitter, what I, what I see is two, whenever you get into that debate, you have to like, emphasize your side in order to account for the failings that you feel on the other side. And so what you end up is two very overstated views, I think. If we could just ratchet it down a notch, I think we could come to some kind of understanding like what you're saying, which is there is a common core between the Wahhabists and the liberal progressive Muslims, which is Islam, the Quran, the, you know, even, um, the most progressive Muslims that I know, aside from Ani Zanaveld, who lives in town here and is the founder of uh, Muslims for Progressive Values, still separate men and women at prayer, still believe that the Quran was given by, uh, by God via Muhammad, and that it's not up to people's interpretation what it says and all of that. So I don't know where this is going, but I do think that we need for some honesty from the liberals, most of all. Like, I think we need for the liberal uh, Muslims to say, yes, there is something Muslim about Wahhabism. It's a plausible reading of Islam. You could get there from here, right? So in the same way that I would say, does Christian, as a pastor, when I served at the church down the street, does Christianity have a homophobia problem? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, it does. I, that was a pretty enthusiastic yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, do, does that mean that all Christians are homophobic? No. Does it mean that Christians need to be homophobic based on what the Bible says? No. Not necessarily. Like if they want to be literal, yeah, some people will say yes because that's what the Bible says. So, you know, I did a little tweet experiment the other day. I said, um, Christianity has a homophobia problem, yes or no? About, you know, I'm not famous, so I got about six responses that said yes, right, yes. Okay, fair enough. Um, Islam has a violence problem, yes or no? Crickets. Like nobody said anything. And I was like, interesting. I'm not saying Muslims are responsible for all Muslim violence or all Muslims are violent or that you need to be violent just because you're Muslim. None of that is true. But there is something about it just from a purely observational point of view. Muslims continue to create violent situations in the world. So I'm thinking there's a, there's a violence problem here somewhere. Or, or does Christian theology contribute to the Duger family doing what they did? Yes, it does. Was I that kind of Christian? No. Would I, as a Christian, would I have ever endorsed that kind of behavior? Absolutely not. Would I have written op-ed pieces about how he's not really a Christian? Probably, right? But I have to say... I was a super critic of Christianity even when I was a pastor. So I've said to my liberal Muslim friends, why can you not join us in critiquing the problems with your religion? Join us in critiquing the bad parts and calling for this reformation. If you, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali has a, the new book. I don't know if any of you have read it yet, but she has a new book out a couple months ago. Of course, Ayan has a really bad reputation among some people, and she said some really, uh, intense things in the past. 2007, she said something like that, um, you know, Islam needed to be destroyed. And the journalist said, violently? And she said, whatever it takes. And, I was, and people were like, damn. <laughs> Them's fighting words, you know? Like, I, that's, that's dangerous talk, right? I, I can't get behind that. Like, I can't support that kind of talk. In her new book, she's ratcheted that way back. And she said, look, this was, I wrote that, I said that before the Arab Spring. I didn't think the Islamic world had, had reformation in their hearts, but they, apparently they do. I think we need to call for a Muslim Islamic re reformation, just like Christianity had a reformation. And Christian, Christian reformation only happened when a Christian monk was willing to critique his own religion 
and almost got killed for it. Several people did get killed for it. So I think it's going to take peaceful, loving, progressive Muslims to say, uh, we need a reformation. We need to think differently about the text. Uh, we need to think differently about the way that we exist in the world. Um, the world is too small. We're too interconnected to have this zero-sum game um, around religion. So, uh, gosh, I probably, if this gets on YouTube, I probably said about six things that I regret. Uh, so I'm, I'm just a little fearful jumping into this, this topic. But I do think it's going to take some honesty in that exchange that you're describing. Um. Yeah, I was wondering if I could hear your definition of atheism, atheism because uh, when I tell people I'm an atheist, they think I'm a communist or the devil or something. Uh, and then Wait, when you guys I, are when not? I, when I listen to <laughs> Richard Dawkins talk, and some people think it's not political either, but, right. but let's say you know Richard Dawkins, he's, he's really big on um, not teaching and in schools and you know letting kids decide. So that, in a right. way, that starts to become political. Right. So so how do we how do we define this or should or should we? Or? Yeah, there are a lot of words. There are a lot of words with lots of definitions. That's one of the first things I learned in Year Without God was like all oh, the definitions of all the words and the fights over definitions. So I'm a I'm a liberal kind of all the way down. And so I, when it comes to linguistics, I'm kind of a liberal too. So uh, what, what I mean is that words words mean what we say they mean. Um, and if we change that, what, we, what we say they mean, uh, then, the, then the meaning changes. Like the word gay, you know, back when my dad grew up, gay meant happy, now it doesn't mean that anymore because we, together we changed the meaning of it somehow. So I think atheist simply means that you don't believe in God. Well, the way I tell people is, question, question, do you believe in God? Yes or no? No, you're an atheist, right? That's, just, that's it, right? Now, um, that has implications. Not believing in God has implications. One of those implications is how do we conduct ourselves in the public square with a society most of whom believe in a, a deity or, or some kind of gods. And the American solution to this is pluralism and democracy, which means that you can bring your private views to the table, but you don't get to enforce your private views on other people, whether they're communism or atheism or anything else, right? So you can be a communist if you want to. You just can't force other people to be communist and threaten to kill them if they don't, right? Like, you can't do that. And so I think the same is true with, with religion. Now, I'm, I'm reading a book by uh, Stephen Prothero right now, who's a big advocate for teaching religion in public schools, but not or teaching about religion, not teaching religion. It's a big difference. So his argument is that we can't successfully engage in our civic dialogue if we don't know anything about religion. So the conversation that we're having right now is a fairly high level conversation. You said Wahhabism. I bet you if you surveyed the United States population, probably only about 5% of the world would know what that even means. Now, I think it's useful for our young people to know what that means, right? I can get behind that. I think that we ought to teach probably high school students about religious pluralism, not to prefer one over the other, but we need to teach them what is Islam, what are the different views about Islam, what is Christianity, what are the different views about Christianity, what is Buddhism. I mean, maybe have some um, religious leaders come in and from a secular perspective say, here's what my people believe, here's what my people believe, so that the public is educated and that Fox News can't then just co-opt their brains by saying all Muslims are violent or these, you know, Muslims ought to be rounded up and put in cages like we had in that m movie with Bruce Willis. What was the name of that movie? Enemy of the State or something like that. So I, I do think that public education about religion is important for uh, a secular civic discourse. Um, I'm not, it's a dicey subject. I don't know how to execute it well. But people aren't learning about religion. And maybe that's a good thing. But in the meanwhile, I think it's risky to have a generation of young people who can't have an intelligent debate about religion. In fact, the, the, my, one of my points of evidence about this is some of the most well-versed people about religion that I've encountered in my lifetime have been in the last year and a half since I've been talking to atheists. Atheists know more about religion than most religious people. Why? Because they have to in order to debate these things intelligently. You can't be ignorant of Islam. You can't be ignorant of Buddhism or Christianity if you want to talk to people about it. You have to know where your dialogue partner is coming from. So that level of intelligence about religion, I think, and literacy is really important. 
Uh, hi. Uh, yes, sir. I feel like uh, Christianity and atheism sometimes are viewed as opposites, mm -hmm. or more so relig religion and atheism. And I was wondering, do you think it's possible for there to be uh, an atheist Christian? And I, I don't mean by like uh, someone who's closeted atheist and a Christian, but someone who partakes in, a, who's an atheist, but partakes in Christian values. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I also want to just acknowledge, I don't know if it took any courage for you to ask that question here, but I just want to say that it may have, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, I, there is, actually, if you Google Christian atheism, there's a Wikipedia article about it. There are books that have been written about it. There are death of God theologians that have been talking about Christian atheism for probably 30 or 40 years. So there is research on it. People have written about it. Um, it's, it's sort of like saying, can you be atheist and Jewish? What, what do you say? Can you be atheist and Jewish? Of course you can. Everybody, everybody believes that, right? Not everybody, but you all believe that. Most of you, yes. I was going to say Jewish is different because it's cultural. It's cultural. If you say Christian, you mean more Gentile, not Jewish. Right. So I think what, what happens with Judaism is that it's much less about orthodoxy, and if, unless you're orthodox, uh, and more about orthopraxy, like doing good deeds, mitzvah, and and. Um, being a part of a community that's organized to heal the world, right? And I think Christianity is going to go that way. Um, there's a, a friend of mine, Greta Vosper, who's actually undergoing a heresy trial, more or less, with the United Church of Canada in Toronto right now because she doesn't believe in God. She's written books about how she doesn't believe in God. It's not a test of faith for her church to believe in God. Um, but they come from a tradition of Christianity, um, and they want to mobilize that tradition for the good of the world. I think the church that I mentioned a minute ago, a block from here, same, uh, same kind of thing. They're not, nobody's going to go to the mat to defend an invisible God in the sky. Like they don't, they're like, yeah, probably not. Um, so I think that there is a way, and I think if we want to foster rationality and healing among, you know, in a religious kind of uh, harmony and pluralism, then there needs to be room made for that. Um, I don't know that it's ever going to be a big movement, but here's the thing. Like, people believe all sorts of things. They practice all sorts of things. The way my family practices Christmas traditions, the way your family does or somebody else's is going to be different. I, I really don't care, like, how you practice your Christmas traditions or if you do at all. Um, I just think that if what's dangerous is when people appeal to a divine intervention to save the world or to save people that sort of cuts off their own action and their own participation in the world. And to me, if you take that out, if you want to refer to Christian poetry, Christian scripture as mythology, um, the way that some people, some people do PhDs in Shakespearean literature. Like I'm not gonna do a PhD in Shakespearean literature, but somebody is doing that and writing interesting things. I might even listen to a lecture about it. It's pretty interesting. Um, so some people are gonna really dive into Christianity. It's, good. it's not going away anytime soon, and I, I do think that there is space for that. In fact, I think there's a lot of Christian atheists that just don't say so. Great, let's leave it there. Thanks, Ryan, give it up for Ryan.